Welcome back to the Velvet Door. Um, you guys already know who I am. It's Shanjor. And, um, you know, I don't like to waste time. I like to jump right into the information. I like to jump right into what is going on in the world. And, you know, I was inspired to do this stream because um, there's a lot happening right now. Um, I have to say in the last two years, I've seen a major shift within um, what we call today Black America. And I think this shift is um, is definitely going to um, set the tone for the next 100 years or more for a lot of us. Even those of us that may have indigenous roots and um, we were reclassified to Black or even misclassified to be Black, Negro, color, mulatto. Some may even say Indian. Um, this is a very telling time. And um, those that are in the political realm, I think they truly understand where we are standing, even if they don't understand the importance and significance of it. But um, everybody else on the sidelines is just barely surviving, right? So you have this extreme reality that's happening. You have one side that is very aware of where we are and they want to schmold and shape where we're going. And then you have another side that is totally unaware of where we're going. And they're just trying to figure out their next meal for tomorrow. So why am I saying that? Why am I saying that? Well, homelessness is on the rise in America. It's a lot happening right now. It's a lot. Um, a lot of people are, are not really doing well. Let's actually look at a few articles about homelessness right now in America. And we're going to jump into, um, you know, what's happening around the country. Um, reparations. People are taking it upon themselves to um, self-identify, right? That's becoming such a big thing now. Everyone wants to self-identify. And, um, you know, it's just where we're going right now. All right, so let's see. Let's see what we're looking at right now. Just give me a sec. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's see. Let's look at this. Boom, right there on the screen. All right. It says, with more than half a million Americans unhoused, the U.S. is still struggling to solve homelessness crisis. And, you know... You you have unhoused, and then you have people who are couch surfing. You have people who are leaning on relatives to survive in this country too, right? So let's let's see what they mean by what by their um definition. It says the COVID pandemic caused a surge in housing costs and a rise in unemployment, leaving nearly six hundred thousand Americans unhoused in twenty twenty. Unhoused. And then it's a key word right here, unhoused. You know what I noticed about that too? Uh, you know, recently I've been noticing that instead of people saying M, the M word, because I don't want to say it. I don't know if you'll be flagged for saying M-U-R-D-E-R -E to, to basically, they say unalive now, right? Unalive a person, right? Now it's unhoused a person. You know, I like how they're, they're softening up these um, these terminologies. But let's pay attention. Let's pay attention. It says, what people don't typically realize when they walk past a person who's homeless is that this person is costing taxpayers a lot of money. Wow. Check that out. In 2019, New York City spent a record-breaking $3 billion to support its homeless population. California is expected to break its record, allocating $4.8 billion to the same issue over the next two years. Wow, wow, wow. So basically what they're telling you in so many words is that, listen, homeless people, you are becoming a nuisance. You are becoming a liability. You are becoming a debt, All right? You guys are pretty much putting us in a position 
that even for the working class that can't even survive, the middle class is barely surviving above water. But yeah, we get to give you free jibs and what little that we do give you for the survive. But let's check this out. Let's check this out. I got I got something else to show you guys. Um, I want to show y'all how the state is banning homelessness in America. Slowly. Oh, hold on one second. Slowly but surely, this is coming the new norm. Let's look at this right here. As law banning sleeping on state-owned land looms, homeless advocates dread results. Now, let's see. This is coming from St. Louis, and it's a number of cities that are starting to pick up on this trend. Starting January 1st, which just passed, Sleeping, camping, or having a long-term shelter on state-owned land will be illegal in Missouri. The change is a result of a new law the Missouri legislator passed this year. The law requires cities and counties to enforce the ban and give the attorney general the ability to act against those who don't. Mm. With just day, a few days until the law goes into effect, Shelters and nonprofits are preparing for how it will further burden or burden homeless populations in the state. Wow. It says Kathy um, Connors, executive director of Gateway 180 Homeless for Services, said the law has created panic and worry. It says, uh, let's see, it's definitely going to extend stress resources that are available, particularly in the area of outreach. It's just going to create much more stress in the system. For the St. Louis area, Connor, Connor said, while shelters have a pretty good handle on how many beds are available, they are still likely going to fall short of the need. All the shelters are not the same. They serve different populations, different individuals, and you just simply cannot make the request of individuals to move to shelter. Okay. So that's also a problem, too. Let's also highlight the fact that there are people who just simply do not want to live in a shelter. I, I know there are people out there who say, why Why would somebody want to choose to live on the streets versus living in a shelter? There's a number of reasons why. Um, sometimes the shelters have certain um, rules and regulations that a person is not willing to follow. A lot of times shelters have curfews um, in which you have to be inside the shelter at a certain time to even get a bed a lot of times. Um, and simply some people just want to be nomadic. They want to do what they want to do. You know, um, and, and, to, and to be fair, America is not the only place you'll see homeless people like this. Um, actually, when I went to um, when I went to Barbados, um, I saw their homeless there. It's not as severe as here. In fact, a lot of the neighbors would feed the homeless people in the streets. But what they call stragglers, um, these are people that decided to just live. You know, they just want to live on their own. Pretty much. They don't, they're not looking to get a job. They're not looking to live with anybody. They want to live in the streets. And there are people who just decide that is the life they want to live. And um, depending on what country you're in, you know, they're not really a nuisance. They're not really a problem. Now, what we're seeing in America, we're seeing a change of a tide. We're we're seeing um we're seeing a a, a privilege almost being a privilege for you to um, participate in society now. And no more are you able to just skate by. Even being homeless and having a job, this is becoming a, a new norm now. There are plenty of people who live in their cars. Um, they live in storage units. They live in people's backyards. Um, they take showers in public locations and gyms, et cetera. There are plenty of people out here who simply just do not have a place to live. They don't, but they still go to work every day. Um, it, it's, it's, um, you know, like I said, it's, it's very interesting, interesting times that we're in to see that this is what it's becoming. But in the same breath of watching these states slowly, but surely change the rules, make it to where, it's pretty much banning you off of state property. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I definitely think that's a, a telltale sign of um, a war on the people, a war on the American people. 
let's see uh Let's see another another website that's talking about the same thing. One second. Let's check this out. How the U.S. criminalizes homelessness. All right. So in this article, you know, we're going to read about these encampments and how... Homeless people can be ticketed and fined. You're already homeless. A lot of times you don't have the money. If you can't pay your ticket, it's a good chance you're going to end up in jail, right? So this is going to take you right back into what we call the private prison industrialized complex. Um, there are going to be new private jail systems that's going to pop up in this country. Um, a lot of whom, which already have... Um, foreign investors, but this is definitely going to be big money business um, to make a somewhat of a, of a gel system as we already have that is going to provide labor free of cost. According to your uh, 13th amendment, free of cost. As more and more homeless people flood the streets, more and more of these private prisons will also be flooded as well. But let's read a little bit what it says. It says, whites live in Austin, Texas, where authorities have cleared several encampments in, in recent months following a public camping ban that voters reinstated this year. It mirrors a new Texas law that criminalizes public camping and ban cities from adopting policies that prohibit or discourage the enforcement of any public camping ban, okay? People who don't comply with the law can be ticketed, arrested, or fined up to $500. But Austin doesn't have nearly enough housing or shelter space for estimated 3,160 residents experience homelessness. Nevertheless, local authorities have forced unhoused people to disperse. Some have relocated to woods mm -hmm, around Austin, whether you're far removed from resources and services like food, healthcare, and sanitation. You know, you know, one time I asked that question before. I said, if you're homeless, why not live in the woods? Why not live in nature? And why not want to be more in tune with nature? And um, one of the things that you, you're going to find is that you might actually pick up a skill set. But here's the thing. Once you become off the grid, I, I I don't know. Maybe all bets are off on you now. Um, may, maybe it's uh, it's up at this point. And whatever happens to you happens to you. And it's only you in nature that can tell that story at that point. And I think that's a dangerous part about pushing people to live off the grid. Though I condone living off the grid, though I will ask the question, why not live off the grid? I also understand the sinister nature of people. I understand that. And to see people in a vulnerable state and to have them in places where they, they can't really adapt in totality, it's going to be hard. But they're going to have no choice. You know, then what are the rules and stipulations on them building on, on on wooded areas, right? Because just because it's a wooded area don't mean that it's not state-owned. Doesn't mean that it's not owned by someone else, right? So these wooded areas, what it does is it takes you out of sometimes U.S. jurisdiction, United States, or maybe that local city jurisdiction. Maybe now you're on private property at this point, right? So if you're on private property, let's say it's Billy Joe's property, Billy Joe can say, well, hell, you can't be on my damn wooded land. You're going to have to find somewhere else to go, right? The state is already saying, well, hell, you can't sleep on my land. You're going to have to find somewhere to go. You're going to find yourself wandering and wandering and wandering when you have nowhere to go. And if you're on the wrong person's land for too long, you can in some sort of way, be legally killed. You're on my private property and I ask you to go. 
In some states, that is very much legal to take up your arms on people who are encroaching on your property. Doesn't this feel like the movie Shrek? You guys remember Shrek? <laughs> I, I hate to bring up the movie Shrek, but I have no idea why the movie Shrek popped in my brain. Remember when all the fairy tale creatures started encroaching on Shrek's land? And he's like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? This is my private property. Where y'all going? And what did he say? He said, the king. They said, the king told us we had to be here. And he had to go through this whole Rick and Moreau and saving his princess and doing all this crazy stuff just because he wanted his own private property back. You know, as we know, you know, you got to watch these on these damn movies. Y'all know these movies always like to tell the truth. Always like to tell the truth. All right, so let's check this out. It says laws that bar people. I'm going down here. No matter of fact, let me see. Let's go up. Let's start it here. Let's go back down. Let's get back into it. The Texas law criminalizes people for trying to survive when there are no other options available. Hmm. It does nothing to address homelessness, but Texas is not alone in adopting such measures. And I want you to understand that this was just two years ago. Possibly three. Laws that the bar people experiencing homelessness from sitting, sleeping, or resting in public places are acts or are prevalent across the country. Some laws prohibit people from living in vehicles. And I know that's true. I know that's true. I know you can't even sleep in your vehicle. You cannot pull over sometimes and sleep in your vehicle without being without a cop coming and knocking on your window asking you, are you okay? Can you move along? And that is very true. Other laws turn literally, littering, asking for money, even sharing food with people, offenses punishable by fines or arrests. All right, sharing food with people, that's very interesting. Because what do they tell you about the birds? If you guys are from New York City or any place, they always tell you don't feed the birds, right? You always get that, these little um, signs that are like along the street says don't feed the birds, so what's going to happen? We're going to start having signs that say don't feed the homeless. Hmm. Interesting. All right. So you could be punished for feeding people. Ain't that some? In many cities, public restrooms are not available overnight or at all. Yet cities prohibit public urination and defecation. All these policy choices discriminate against unhoused people. As authorities eject them from public spaces, confiscate and destroy their property, and segregate them in often unsanitary and inhumane mass shelters and jails. Practices that threaten their health and well-being and ultimately their lives. Okay. Let's skip down here. It says, according to the National Center of Homeless Education, more than 1.3 million public school students experienced homelessness during the 2018 to 2019 school year. Meanwhile, the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is HUD, most recent pre-pandemic survey counted about 580,000 plus unhoused people on a single night in January 2020. And, and I'm going to tell you guys, it's going to get worse. Okay. It's going, to, it's going to get worse. Even here in New York City, uh, we've, we've always had a very large population of homeless children. The hustle of having foster kids have always been a thing since I was a damn kid and before me. So we've, yeah, that this has always been, it's always been here. And, and unfortunately, it's going to get worse. All right, I'm down here, guys. And then we're going to move on to the next topic after this. It's, it's all kind of, all like, kind of like running together. The economic fallout of the ongoing pandemic has forced more people to live without shelter, meaning homelessness could increase 49% over the next four years. Did I say that? It has been on the rise for the last five years. Those experiencing homelessness are disproportionately people of color. The result of centuries of discrimination in housing, education, employment, health care, and criminal legal system. It says black people make up 12% of the U.S. population, but they account for 39% of people experiencing homelessness. Wow. 
you imagine that number? So that's 39% of all America, but you're only supposed to be 12%. Now, I want y'all to understand that you used to be 13%. You used to be 13%. So even with black immigration, you are decreasing. Hmm. Let's talk about it. It says unhoused people of color are also more likely to be cited, search, cited, search, and have property taken. Similarly situated uh, white people. La, la, la. The homelessness crisis available, uh, affordable crime crisis, untenable rent burdens have priced people out of their homes. That is very true. Blah, 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 blah. So we kind of, um, we kind of get where this is going. We, we, we know what's happening. We know what's happening. We see the tent cities popping up all over California. We've seen it. New York City, we see homeless people all over the train. You can't go in one car on the train without seeing the homeless people laying on the train seats. We see it. You know, we're, we're just in very, very interesting, interesting times. Very trying times. And I know that there are people... Um, trying to figure out what's their next move and the way out. Um, this is the time of family. This is the time of you're going to have to start putting and pooling your resources together. Um, this is the time you turn off your social media and turn on your social reality and look at what is really happening around you? And I don't care if you have a house, you have a car. Listen, I have all those things, but that does, that does nothing. That does nothing for me to never sit here and say, I need to prepare just in case. Just in case. So let's talk about it. Let's get back into the land ownership. Because we're talking about homelessness and we're talking about people who um, have fallen on hard times. That does not mean you didn't come from money. That doesn't mean you didn't come from a well-to-do family. You fell on hard times. Right? That does not mean that you automatically had to have a reality of being enslaved. They don't mean that. At some point. Because what you find is that along the way, because of these, these economic resets that we've had in this country within the last century or so, um, we had um, the different recessions, the Great Depressions, the wars, and all these things that have hit us left and right as an American population and people. Um, you're finding that people are trying or they have always been trying to find ways to protect their wealth, regardless of what's going to happen. Because America has proven it will not sustain a stable economy. If you have not learned that by now, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know where you've been at. I can't tell you in the last four to five hundred years when America had a stable economy economy it's never had it it's never had it so even if you come into money if you have a savings if you have some sort of investments you need to figure out how to protect it this country does not guarantee you longevity but it can give you a shot at it that's it that's it what you do with that shot that's on you. Aim right. So let's see. So let's go on to the Bruce family. The Bruce family. And if you guys not are up to speed, the family has officially sold Bruce Beach. That's right. You read that right. Sold it. Now they fought for a few years to get this land back. Got the land, sold it, okay? 
so good. And, and, you know, for me, I'm not really here to say whether it's right or wrong. Like, I, like, I, I don't want that to be my position. I don't really want that to be my position. I'm more so here to um, understand. That, that's my role. Because the reality is that the Bruce family is not the indigenous family that own that particular land in that state at that location. That land did belong to someone else. But they purchased the land. Right? They had a fair transaction where they purchased that land to make a resort for black families in America. Right? So um let's read a little bit. Let's see what they say about the situation. Because it has a lot of people upset. Um, matter of fact, let me show you some some responses on my Twitter. I'm gonna show you some response. We're gonna come back to that. We'll come back to that. Uh that screen I just showed you guys but I'm going to show you some responses to um, how people feel about them selling this um, resort off let's see all right so I have posted on my Twitter <laughs> you got people saying, uh, let's see, stupid as F sounds like what black American going to do. They actually get reparations, get it all just to give it right back. Hmm. Someone said, I wish they would have kept it. Okay. Someone said different times, different mindsets, no plans for the land. Greed. Okay. Uh, someone said, what the entire F Okay, Sh shake my head. That's not enough money. <laughs> ah, okay. So let's so let's get into it. Let's get back to it. Um. So six months ago, the Bruce family, um, they were able to get back the beachfront property that they purchased. Manhattan Beach. Now it was taking because of a um they were they were pretty much um made to and for, forcefully removed from the land, right? Forcefully removed. It says on Tuesday the county announced a surprise twist in the historic deal. <laughs> okay, I highlight that surprise twist. Come on, get out of here. The family would sell the Bruce's Beach property back to the county for nearly $20 million. Let me tell you something. That is chump change. California. Beachfront. People are paying for a house. People are paying $8 million. $10 million. For houses to sit over Hollywood on top of a, a damn mountain. Just a house. No land. Just a house. Barely a backyard. But a resource like land. 20 million. Well. You know. Hey man. It says in an effort to right the wrongs of the past, the board made a, a monumental decision in June to return Manhattan Beach land to the descendants of the Bruces, a move celebrated nationally by reparation advocates. I want of the same reparation advocates support them selling it back to L.A. now. Let's see. It says as part of the agreement, Bruce family members had two year window in which they could require the county to buy back the property from them. And they decided to do just that. Okay. Hmm. So the attorney who represents the family said in an interview, the sale was not unexpected and the family had always wanted to have the option to sell the property back to the county. He emphasized the sale was still a victory for the Bruce descendants who would no longer have the land 
their grandparents were robbed of, but instead the money they should have inherited. Ay, 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 ay. If y'all can see me right now, look, next time I'll get on camera, but if y'all can see me right now, my hands is on my head. You don't want the land your ancestors own, but you want the fiat that is about to get destroyed. Ay, ay, ay. I told y'all I was gonna be neutral and I wasn't gonna take a side. I told y'all I was gonna be neutral, but um <laughs> Ooh, that, that's interesting. It says what was stolen from the family was the property, but what the property represented was the ability to create create and preserve and group pass down generational wealth. Oh, really? As if generational wealth is not a natural resource. And by allowing the family now to have certainty in selling this property to the county, taking the proceeds of that sale and investing it into their own futures. Oh, really? That's for storing some of what the family lost. I think we all need respect, the family decision to know what's in the best interest. Yeah. And you know what? This little statement right here is because they know that once this comes out to the public, we're going to disagree with that decision that they made. They, they know that. Because we were on their side all these years to get that property, to take that property, to invest in that property, to make it back into what it could be, should be, and will be, and you sold it again. All right. Multiple factors contributed to the family decision. For one, he said none of the descendants live in Southern California and they were in stages of their life where they wanted money to invest. Invest in what? Invest in what? What are you investing in? What? I mean, what? <laughs> what are you investing in? You had beachfront property, and, and you know, you know what's you know what's really cold about the situation is that they knew, and I'm talking about the family, the county, the state. They knew they was gonna give up that land again. They knew that. That's why they didn't mind giving it back. I know you don't really have a connection to this piece of land. You don't even want to identify as being indigenous land. You don't even want to talk about indigenous because you're calling yourself black. I mean, that's your prerogative, but the way how you're going about the situation, it tells the court systems that you, you ain't really got that much of a connection to it. You just want what you possibly can acquire from it. And that's okay. Like I said, that's okay if that's your story. But maybe it's our fault that we were all rooting for this family to win and to make that black a black resort. Maybe that's where we were wrong. Maybe that's where we were wrong. It says, he said also, the land was not zoned for development and the family members were worried, uh, worried of the years long permitting, permitting fight they would need to wage if they wanted to start building. At the end of the day, the family was very focused on was certainty and being able to access the proceeds of the sale. Well, I know they are. Trust me. That cash in your hand feels good, baby. They feel what is best for them is selling the property back to the county for nearly 20 million. That's not a lot. And finally, rebuilding generational wealth, they were denied for or nearly a century. And look what they say. This is what reparations look like. It is a model. And I hope governments across the country will follow. Hmm. 
check that out, right? Check that out. Check that out. That's what they want you to follow. Cash. Fiat. Over resources. Fiat. Over resources. They got you caught up in... Com uh, consumerism. Sorry, y'all. I'm trying to type and... Do this real quick. They got you caught up in rat race. Huh. Ain't this some? Why do you do this? Why do we do this? I gotta ask that question. Why do we do this? And what do we get from this type of stuff? Now, if the family individually, if they go on to buy other land in America, that's very possible, right? It's very possible. They said they want to invest. And that's very possible. Let's look at something real quick. Let's look at something real quick. Let's see. Let's make this big. Alico Dengote. I hope I pronounced that right. Worth $13.9 billion. Is the richest African on the planet. Guess what his wealth is in. <laughs> Not tech. Not spaceships. Not Twitter. Not Facebook, not shoes, not hats, not wigs, lashes, cement, sugar. I'm going to say that one more time. Cement. Sugar. Sugar, manufacturing, yeah. Sugar, Africa's richest person, the continent's largest cement producer, and he owns 85% of his publicly traded company. After many years in development, his fertilizer plant in Nigeria began operations in mid-2021. Fertilizer plant. Resources. He has a refinery that's under construction and expected to be one of the world's largest oil refineries. Once complete. Look at this guy. Look at that guy. Look at look at that face. Only a mother could love. L look at him. What is he rich in? Now he's the second richest African. Um, luxury goods though. Fashion retail. So he'd be the one selling you a bunch of crap that you don't need. But this guy right here. Manufacturing, keyword. 
What is it that you produce? You want to talk about generational wealth? Okay. What is it that you produce? What is it that you create from scratch? In an abundance. Where you can ship across the world tons. Not pounds, but tons. What is it that you cultivate that you can send tons of? This is how you build generational wealth. You produce. You get others to invest. And and what does that say? Self-made. And see, this is not a situation to compare Americans to Africans, Africans to Americans, but it's more so to just show In America, sometimes we are we're we're exposed and taught a very weird way of thinking about wealth. And we we make a lot of money, but we make a lot of bad investments. So you thought I was gonna say we spend a lot of money. No, we do spend a lot of money, but you guys make a lot of bad investments. Remember when they was like doing those 30 for 30s with the basketball players? And like some of them were investing like car washes and all these different things and they all fell through. Yeah, bad investments. That that That's a lot of times what we're looking at. So where do we go from here? We get our land, we sell it. Now I did read that um, the family was leasing this land out for a few months. Let me see if I can um, find that for you guys for a quick one second. I Cause I did read that the family was selling that land out. Let's see. Let me see if I can find it. I might not can't find it, but this was not a situation where the family was not offered the opportunity to lease that land out. They 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 were in a situation where they were leasing it here ago. The county maintains a lifeguard training facility on the property. Since the property was transferred last summer, the county had been leasing it from the Bruce's for $413,000 a year. Ah. So the question is, do the, do the Bruce's feel like they won't ever see $20 million in their lifetime? And that's why they wanted to take the quick payout over the $413,000 uh, four hundred, four hundred thirteen thousand dollars that could happen a year for multiple generations to come. Let's do some quick math on that. Let's do some quick math. How about that? All right. I'm gonna get my calculator. Matter of fact, let's see. Hold on. Give me a second, guys. Let's see if I can get me a calculator. Get my calculator. <laughs> All right, let's do some let's do some math. Let's see if we can um figure this out. All right, so we got 4 That's how much you would have been paying. Was that per month? Let's make sure that's per month. Was that per month, y'all? Oh, that's per year. That's per year. Okay, so per year. So, mm, 15 years. Let's see. How much would that have been in 15 years? Let's see. Let me get my calculator again. Hold on, y'all. Where'd you go, calculator? Here we go. Let's go. Times. 
Six million. Okay. So let's go back. Let's do this. How much would this would have been worth then? Let's say 50 years. Uh huh. Okay. It's, yeah. 20 mil. So it would have took them 50 years to hit the 20 mil mark. That's not even a whole generation. And then they still could have went another 50 years. Let's time that by two. That's one lifetime. And that wouldn't even include investments on the side or other people that would come and lease it out as well. Hey, that's their prerogative, right? So like I said, hey, they said that was this is what's best for them. Sometimes you got to let people make their own decisions, right? But you know, but um when we see things like this, let's uh Let's look at this real quick. When we see things like this, though, you know, it's a little hard to, um, it's a little hard to grasp. But this is America, Jack, right? <laughs> As above, so below. The duality of it all. And at one point, they will meet in the middle. As more and more black and indigenous people in this country fall to the whims of this society as it goes to its reset. They will remember those that had land, those that still have land, grandma house that was sold off. Then remember all these times when they had it. But then they also will live with the reality that they sold it. Right? Not all, look, not all, not all, but most, but not all. Let's talk about something real quick and then we're going to wrap this up. Let's show you guys something real quick. I touched on this in my last interview with um, Leon Robinson about black home ownership. And as of early last year, it was lower than it ever was a decade ago. So you guys make a lot of money. You make a lot of money now. You look good doing it too. But black home ownership is down. 43.4% and remains lower. It continues to decrease. And is nearly 30 percentage points behind the white home ownership rate of 72.1%. Meanwhile, the Hispanics over here, their rate has rose. They have over 50%. For the first time. And we didn't even got to touch on Asians, right? Housing affordability and low inventory has made it even more challenging for all buyers to enter into home ownership, but even more so for Black Americans. 
Huh. It says today, home ownership is the principal source of wealth creation for most American households. Unfortunately, NAR's or NAR's report confirms that Black Americans are being locked out of home ownership opportunities at an even higher rate than a decade ago. You're more college educated now. Okay? You drive better cars now. You wear better makeup now. You got better designer clothes now. You even got better phones and technology and computers now. You take better trips. You can't stop you from taking two to three trips every year. You're traveling. You got passports. You're doing a damn thing. But guess what? More now than ever, you can't build wealth through home ownership. Why is that? And it's not that you can't get it. What's going on? It says, meanwhile, housing inventory has declined to under 1 million units available for sale. And about half of those homes are only affordable to households with at least $100,000, 100K in an annual income. The average income for a black man is, I think, 40 to 50K. The average income for a black woman is 30K. Combine the two, you're barely touching 80 to 90K. We got work to do. And then when I speak to black, I am speaking to indigenous because a lot of my indigenous people, we are classified as black, especially those who are not changing their, their classification. They still identify as black despite their heritage. We got work to do. See you later.